And now it's time for the Everlasting Gospel. Welcome to the Everlasting Gospel today. My name is Gary McDade, and I'm the host of the program. It's great to have you with us. In this program today, we'll be studying about benefiting from the high priesthood of Christ. Let me encourage you to get your Bible if you're where you can. We'll be looking at a number of passages of Scripture, and I think you'll be very edified to read along with us in your Bible. Sometimes we look at so many verses, people say it's hard to keep up. If you're watching on TV, as this is also a radio program, I'll put the verse numbers up there a lot of times, and that helps to be able to take a look. But we have a grand benefit by the high priesthood of Jesus Christ, and we'd like to study about that a little bit today. So the title of the lesson is Benefiting from the High Priesthood of Christ. In a previous lesson, we talked about Consider the High Priesthood of Christ, where we looked at it at pretty good depth. The passage that we notice where this is taught is in Psalm 110, verse 4, which says, The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The significance of that is Melchizedek, found in Genesis 14, was both king and priest simultaneously. And Christ is a priest after that order. Notice that God's not going to change his mind in that connection. In a previous study, we looked at six points and a lot of scripture about considering the high priest of Christ. I'll just simply put them here in a quick overview fashion for review. We studied how that Christ was made a high priest by God himself and that the high priesthood of Jesus Christ and the fact that he is now in heaven, he led the way for us. Also, he had to reach certain qualifications in order to be high priest, and we enumerated several of those. Most of this information, in fact, all of the information that we looked at under these six points comes from the book of Hebrews. It's a great book to study. Also, we saw that Christ is our high priest in heaven, contrasted with those priests who had served under the Old Testament law here on earth. And also we noted in particular that Christ cannot be a high priest on earth from Hebrews 8 and 4. He's king and priest at the same time. So if he can't be a high priest on earth, guess what? He can't be a king on earth either because they are simultaneous positions, king and priest. And then also Christ appears in the presence of God for us. And that's where I'd like for us to spend a lot of attention today is looking at what he's doing for us at God's right hand as our high priest. May I just notice with you from the beginning, these prophecies in the Old Testament about the high priesthood of Christ, like the one that's our central text, Psalm 110 verse 4, these are some serious prophecies. And they tell what Christ would do when he came to the world, lived among men, died on Calvary, was buried, and was raised from the dead the third day and ascended back to God. The Old Testament talked about what Jesus would be doing from the time of his ascension till his second coming. For example, in 2 Samuel 7, starting with verse 12, we learn that it was prophesied that he would receive a kingdom and he would build his kingdom. In passages like Zechariah 6, verse 12 and 13, we read, And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch. He shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Notice what the Messiah would do. Build the temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord. Notice the emphasis. Christ is the one who is going to do the building. And he shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule upon his throne. Notice he's a king and priest simultaneously. And he shall be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. So here you have this great relationship where Christ is king over his kingdom and priest unto God over this temple that he is going to build. So these are some pretty serious prophecies. If they're not fulfilled somewhere in the New Testament, then we don't have the Christ. We don't have a correct understanding of the Christ. And that's one of my motivations in wanting to study this today. This is not a kind of topic that's talked about a whole lot, but it contains great value in understanding Jesus Christ and his present work at the right hand of the throne of God. 
We noted that and considered that in a previous study. So today we'll move more into the last point we studied last time about Christ appears in the presence of God for us. And that will come to us from Hebrews 9. And we want to look at verses 11 to 17. And then in the interest of time, we'll skip all the way down to verse 22 and read through verse 29. And that's what we'll do in just a minute. But before we get there, I think there's some preliminary explanation that is needed. We've been talking about the Christ building his kingdom, Christ building his temple. Well, how is that going to come about? Let's get some clarity on that. And then I think we'll be able to appreciate much more full the concept of Christ as our high priest. There's a passage for us in the New Testament in Ephesians, the second chapter. And in Ephesians 2, verses 19 to 21, we learn that the church of Christ, because the church belongs to Christ, it is his church, Matthew 16, 18 and 19. We learn that as Paul writes to the church of Christ at Ephesus, he reminds them that they are the fellow citizens with the saints. That's who they are fellow citizens with the saints. This is verse 19. And also, he says, they are of the household of God. So in looking at what the church is, it is made up of saints who are all fellow citizens in this kingdom that Christ built, starting with the first Pentecost after the resurrection called the church. Also, its members are fellow citizens. It is the household of God. 1 Timothy 3.15 tells you that the church is the house of the living God. Just like this verse does here in Ephesians 2.19. Also, we learn that the church is the building of Christ because members are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building framed together groweth into an holy temple in the Lord. So the church is the building of Christ. He's the one who built it. And then the point of verse 20, 21 and 22, that the church is a holy temple in the Lord. So if Christ is going to be a high priest, he's going to need a temple. Well, that temple is his church. See verse 21, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. So this is not a literal temple like Solomon's temple or Zerubbabel's temple after Solomon's temple was destroyed in 586 B.C. and then Zerubbabel's temple was built in 520 B.C. and existed all the way up to A.D. 70. Not a physical temple like that, but rather it is the people that are members of the church that Christ built. He's building this temple. He's building this church. Over it, he will serve as king and as high priest. So I wanted us to get some clarity about what is meant about Christ being our high priest today, that he has built a temple, and we now know what that is. It is the church. He's writing to the church at Ephesus. And he's letting them know that they constitute the temple, the holy temple in the Lord. It's not a physical building. It is people who are citizens of his kingdom. Now, I want you to notice something else as we begin to take a look at what is involved concerning this holy temple. Members of the church of Christ are made to be a kingdom of priests. Now, oftentimes... The greatest difficulty I have in presenting what the Bible says on this topic is preconceived ideas of what a priest is. You know, most people, when you think of a priest, you think of the Roman Catholic priest, referring to himself as father, taking the vow of celibacy, wearing his collar backwards, you know, special clothing. And you think of that as a priest. In the New Testament, that's not what you have. And that's the greatest, I think, barrier to overcome in understanding and appreciating and benefiting from the high priesthood of Christ today is people's misunderstanding of what a priest is and who priests are. Let's look right here at Revelation 1 and read verses 4 through 6. Now notice in verse 4 of Revelation 1, the Apostle John writes, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia. So to whom is he writing? 
two churches, seven in particular, located in the various geographical locations pointed out in chapters 1, 2, and 3 of the book of Revelation. He's writing to churches. Now, what does he say to the churches? Well, he says, Grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. I want to just pause right there for a minute and emphasize that. The church is washed from their sins in the blood of Christ. Who was it that did the washing? Christ. When are we washed? There is a passage that correlates this idea in Acts chapter 22 and verse 16 where a repentant sinner is told by a preacher, and now why tarriest thou arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins calling on the name of the Lord. So baptism is that action that washes away sins. That is the point at which the blood of Christ is applied to the sinful condition of the soul, and the sinner becomes a saint at baptism. That's when Christ washed us from our sins in his own blood. Well, that baptism is preceded by faith. Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, Mark 16, 16. That baptism is preceded by belief and repentance. Repent and believe the gospel, Mark 1, 4. That baptism is preceded by confession that if you believe in your heart, you may. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Acts 8, 36 and 37. And so there is that confession of Christ that is made. And now then baptism is connected with one's salvation. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Mark 16 at verse 16. So please note in those passages of Scripture, that is how we are washed from our sins in His own blood. That's really foundational to an understanding of how we benefit from the high priesthood of Christ. For look at the very next verse, Revelation 1.6. And Christ hath made us kings, the American Standard Version says, a kingdom, and priests unto God His Father, To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So by being washed from our sins in his own blood and baptism, that is how he makes us a kingdom. That is how he makes us priests. Isn't that remarkable? Now, we really don't hear a lot about this today. And if you've never heard this before, I'm glad to introduce you to it. If you're familiar with it, I hope we appreciate it more and more. Because every time I read about it, it calls to my mind my responsibility as a Christian to be serving in the kingdom of Christ under his governmental leadership. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. With Christ being the head of the church, Colossians 2 and 19. And in the worship that we seek, for us to be serving as priests unto God, because Jesus Christ is our high priest. The fact that he is our high priest, as we saw in the first verse that we looked at, that would be Psalm 110, verse 4, it implies that there are other priests if you have a high priest. There are other priests over which he rules and guides. And that would be those who are Christians, those who are members of the Church of Christ. Now, by Church of Christ, I don't mean some denomination. I mean the Church of Christ as you read about it in your Bible. For example, in Romans 16, 16, where Paul said the churches of Christ salute you. That's what we mean to be presenting in this study, is the church of Christ as we find it on the pages of inspiration. So I think it's necessary for us to see that the church is a holy temple. We've seen that from Ephesians 2, verse 19 to 22. And that Jesus Christ has made those whom he has washed from their sins in his own blood, he's made them to be a kingdom, and that kingdom is a kingdom of priests. Now let's notice a little bit further another verse of Scripture, this penned by the Apostle Peter. This is 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. The Apostle Peter writes to Christians, 
Ye also, as lively stones or living stones, are built up a spiritual house. We've been talking about that, haven't we? We've seen how that the church is the house of God, 1 Timothy 3.15. We've seen in Ephesians 2.19, the church is the house of God, a holy habitation. So you as living stones or lively stones are built up a spiritual house. Remember a minute ago we said the temple is not a physical temple. It's a spiritual one, a spiritual house, a spiritual temple. He goes on to say in 1 Peter 2, 5, and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Now, the latter part of this verse, I know we've got a lot of other words on the screen and we'll come to those, but I want to emphasize the latter part of verse 5 where he says that we are a holy priesthood for a purpose, a reason. And what is that reason? To offer up spiritual sacrifices. Now, in the Old Testament, the priests offered up animal sacrifices and meal offerings and other sacrifices called for in the law, primarily in Exodus and Leviticus. Today, in order for the priest to officiate today, they must offer up spiritual sacrifices. And notice these sacrifices are to be acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So now then, here we are priests today, since we're Christians, and we've got a job to do, a responsibility. And that is to worship God in His temple, which is His church. Jesus Christ is the high priest overseeing that worship. And all the other Christians who are priests offer up spiritual sacrifices unto God. Now, it is true in daily living we offer up spiritual sacrifices. For example, in Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, the apostle urged that we present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So first, in regard to our being priests, made so by Jesus Christ, our high priest, when he washed us from our sins in his own blood, we offer up spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Our bodies are living sacrifices offered up to be acceptable unto God. But also as priests and a temple, you think of worship. And in connection with worship, you'll notice that those sacrifices that are to be made are five in number in our New Testament. Now, this is a very hasty summary of worship, and it's only an outline. We have to study the New Testament to really put the meat on the bones or to fill out this outline. But I can give it to you pretty succinctly. We have in worship that we are to be singing praises unto God, Ephesians 5, 19. We are to be preaching the word, 2 Timothy 4, 2. We are to pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. On the first day of the week, we are to give of our means, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1 and 2. Also on the first day of the week, we are to observe the Lord's Supper, Acts 20 and verse 7. What is involved in that is remembering the Lord and His death and showing forth His death till He comes, 1 Corinthians 11 verse 20 through 34. So like I said, there's a lot to be said about those five avenues of worship, but there you have them succinctly, concisely put. And as a priest, we need to be familiar with our service that we're rendering in the temple of God, which is the church of Christ. And that is to be singing, praying, preaching, observing the Lord's Supper and giving of our means. Every priest needs to know what his role is. Now, the Old Testament priests learned that from the book of Leviticus, the priest's handbook. It's very detailed in regard to the way they were to serve in the Old Testament tabernacle and later the temple. The New Testament, as you've seen, is also instructional in telling us how to worship to God, worship God so that that worship will be acceptable to God. Notice, by Jesus Christ. We are taught to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, 
do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks unto God and the Father by Him. That's Colossians 3, verses 16 and 17. So the priest today in the church of Christ knows that he must look at the Word of God, let it dwell in him richly, that is, you need to know it well, and then offer up spiritual sacrifices. We've mentioned five that conform to New Testament worship, singing, praying, preaching, the Lord's Supper, the giving of our means that are acceptable to Jesus Christ. And we're offering that up as priest to our high priest who is in heaven on our behalf. So that's really a marvelous notion about the priesthood and every Christian being a priest. And you had the verses there, 1 Peter 2, 5. Let's look a little bit closer at verses 9 and 10 of 1 Peter 2 on that same point. Peter went on to say, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. You know why we're a royal priesthood? Because our king and high priest is also a king. He's of the tribe of Judah. We have a royal priesthood because our high priest is both king and priest. Never did that happen in the Old Testament. But with Jesus Christ, it's unique to him. It did not happen that the children of Israel enjoyed a high priest that way that was both king and priest. Melchizedek was that way now in Genesis 14. And that's what we know of him. He's king and priest at the same time. He was from Salem. But we don't see that again until we get to Christ in the book of Hebrews. A chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him. See, that's why we're priests, in order to show forth these praises. When people don't even understand that they are priests today because they're Christians, look what they're missing out on. This is what the Bible teaches in this connection, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So I want you to be able to see some of that as we study about how to benefit from the high priesthood of Christ. Now let's take a moment and go to that sixth, sixth point in a preceding lesson. And let's look at Christ appears in the presence of God for us. And let's go to Hebrews chapter 9 and read verse 11 and following. Hebrews 9, 11. Be thinking about Christ being our high priest and us serving as priests unto God. Verse 11, Hebrews 9. But Christ, being come in high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, physical building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who, through the eternal Spirit, offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause he's the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise it is no, of no strength at all while the testator liveth. All of the provisions of Christ being the high priest, of Christians being priests and serving him and offering these sacrifices unto him, that bring us into the throne room of God by faith, all of those are available through the New Testament. No other document can do that. No other council can allow or afford that. All of this is a provision of New Testament teaching. Sometimes today people say, what are you religiously? I'll say, I'm a New Testament Christian. Because that's the only kind of Christian there is, for one. And also I like to emphasize that I'm a Christian because that's what the New Testament teaches. It organizes and orders our thinking and our life so that we can benefit from the high priesthood of Christ. He offered his blood once for our sins. He entered into the holy place one time. That's where our high priest is, with his sinless blood to make atonement for our sins. Look down in Hebrews 9 with me at verse 22. And let's read a little further about how we benefit from the high priesthood of Christ. 
the writer goes on to say, Hebrews 9.22, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. It was necessary, therefore, that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, talking about the Old Testament tabernacle, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Ladies and gentlemen, Brethren and friends, that is how we benefit from the high priesthood of Christ today. But let's read further, verse 25. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Marvelous verses of Scripture that let us know how we benefit from the high priesthood of Christ. If I didn't understand what it was that Christians are priests, I want to know more about that so I'd make sure I had it right. And good verses to look at on that have been pointed out. Verses like 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, and then verses 9 through 10. The, the idea of the temple, that's in Ephesians 2, verses 19 to 22. And then the book of Hebrews is filled with it, especially here in chapter 9. Also, Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6 He's writing to members of the church, telling them that they're a kingdom, a kingdom of priests, and Christ is their king and high priest. All of that is very wonderful teaching. It shows us how we can have forgiveness of sins today is because Christ is in heaven with the blood that was shed on the cross there to make atonement for our sins. Only those who are priests can approach him. Before we leave today, I'd like to notice in particular with you that members of the Church of Christ are made to be a kingdom of priests. And here's how. They hear the gospel. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, we see the word of God is not just an inert word or a series of letters on a page, but the word of God is quick or alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Secondarily, we learn that we must believe in Christ. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Hebrews eleven six. We are to repent of sins when the times, the seasons of refreshing shall come from the Lord. Acts three nineteen. We are to confess Christ. Romans ten nine. That thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. And we're to be baptized into Christ. Hebrews 10, mentions having our bodies washed with pure water. Then we are to hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Thanks for being with us today. Won't you return?